too, but don't forget to unmute the computer. Can you mute this? What is the point of life? What do we gain from all our work, toil, and strife? Ecclesiastes introduces us to a wise man who sought to give these questions a reply. This man, called the preacher, spent his life conducting experiment after experiment trying to supply a hypothesis. But to all his experiments, there was one consistent restriction he applied, one limitation under which all his experiments would come. He would only look for answers under the sun. He limited his experiments to what could be experienced on earth, under heaven. In all his tests and evaluations, he basically took God out of the equation. He let his sight be confined to only look at the world around him. And all he was able to find is that the answers he sought here on earth were vain, absurd, and impossible to define. And so he concludes, vanity of vanities. Everything is vanity. This is his most constant reply. For everything that takes place under the sun defies all sense, like chasing after the wind. It's a useless exercise. Vanity of vanities. Everything is vanity. And he is so passionate about this message and speaks with such urgency because the experiments recorded in Ecclesiastes aren't just philosophical, they are his autobiography. The preacher sought purpose in becoming knowledgeable and wise. He busied himself with learning until he surpassed every other mind. But. The more answers he demanded, the more questions they supplied. So the more he knew, the more he came to know that as he increased his knowledge, he also increased his sorrow. And so when knowledge and wisdom could not provide answers to his questioning, the preacher concluded, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. The preacher tried again, but this time with something more tangible and immediate. He sought out pleasure and experience. Everything his eyes desired, he allowed himself to be given. He surrounded himself with wine and women, with food and riches. He sought out comfort and decadence, wild parties and explorative romance. He tried to find the point of life in anything that seemed appealing, but all of it was deceiving. None of it delivered purpose or gain, satisfaction or meaning, none of it was permanent, all of it was fleeting. So he concluded, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Then he thought, if all our work is futile and the point of all our toil ultimately fails, then he would find a way to be content in doing the work itself. So he gave himself to his labor, to enjoying it and to doing it well. But no matter what he made and no matter what he was able to make of himself, he realized death would take it all and it would be given to someone else. Everything was the same. Wisdom, pleasure, toil, and wealth, work, success, or living wisely and well, none of it could make sense of the world under the sun. Nothing could give a point to life before death said it was done. And so as the preacher looked back on his life to find something he could pass on, he wrote his account to preserve what he learned before he was gone. And his account, found in Ecclesiastes, mainly records bleak reflections on his experiments in vanity. 
And while there are brief mentions of God, his ultimate justice and sovereignty, these truths above the sun are never brought down to his reality. And that is the true vanity the preacher's words help us name. That unless we look above the sun for answers, everything will be vain. For if we are to remain under the sun, there is only one solution the preacher gives to everyone. Simply enjoy your work and your food before your lives are done, because the answer you seek is vain and absurd, or there simply is not one. And all that is true if you are only looking under the sun. But the preacher is not the only voice found in Ecclesiastes lines. A compiler wrote a conclusion to the preacher's words like an epilogue or reply. And the author's advice is summed up in one sentence, fear God and obey his commandments. That's what should be stirring in our hearts as we wrestle with the preacher's disenchantment, that we need God and his word to know how to live in this world and to understand it. But for many of us, thinking about God doesn't really relieve any of the vanity. It's easy for us to get stuck believing that the pointlessness of the world will always win, as it has always won. We find it impossible to not get stuck only looking under the sun. And that is because, above everything, the only thing that can truly cut through all the vanity is that the God who is above the sun entered our reality in Jesus, who is God the Son. He removed the restriction the preacher applied to his experiment, for he brought heaven to earth to bring us life and show us how to live it. The preacher says knowledge is pointless, but Jesus says knowing him is a treasure. The preacher says our desires can't be fulfilled. Jesus says he is our ultimate pleasure. The preacher says riches never satisfy. Jesus says his provision is better. The preacher says all our toil is in vain. Jesus says our work in him will last forever. The preacher tried to prove our questions are unanswerable, but Jesus proved he is the answer because the preacher says everything dies, but the gospel of Jesus says those in him will never. What is the meaning of life? Fear God and keep his commandments. And we do this not by chasing after the wind, but by running after Jesus. Some really good stuff. You grab the light. Thanks. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes has been a very intriguing book to go through. And as we finally have reached the conclusion to this book, it really reminds me of the first time that I watched the second Star Wars movie, right? The Empire Strikes Back. And I remember watching it as I was around the age eight or nine years old and how depressing the end of that movie was and how heartbroken I was because of it. Like, how could the bad guys win? It seemed bleak and disappointing, depressing, but that's not where it ended, right? And that is not where our story ends either. Though most of this book is depressing, it does have a lot of uh, things that it, it comes to wrong conclusions about life. As if there is no hope, but the light is coming. And in particular, the last two verses of this book are going to give us the real solution to man's problems. So let's pray this morning. Father, we ask you right now to meet us where we are at. 
Lord, and that your word would penetrate our hearts and that your word would transform our lives. Lord, through your word, Lord, we want to see you. God, to you alone be the glory. Amen. So the last couple of weeks, we have discussed this notion that foolishness, right? Foolishness is a sign of immaturity. So not surprising anybody on that one. And the act, a, a one foolish act can have severe consequences. We see this throughout Scripture, don't we? We see Abraham telling Pharaoh Sarah was his sister, which was a half-truth. And what ended up happening to him, the consequence was that Abraham and all of his uh, belongings and all of his, his people were ejected from Egypt. Noah's testimony was damaged by one episode of shameful drunkenness. David's life and family were forever changed by a weak moment of, indulgen, of indulgence in lust. Moses wasn't allowed to into the promised land because of one rash action of frustration, impatience, and anger. We see the severe consequence of foolish acts sometimes. Also last week, we saw that Solomon would give some sound advice pertaining to a person's occupation. That as you are working, you need to plan things out and keep good records. We saw that we need to expect the unexpected and be prepared for uh, any sort of incidents. And that working smarter is better than working harder, right? Right? Work smarter, not harder. Because improper planning can risk the loss of income, but not just income, loss of life. And the truth that we can apply to our lives as we were going through our chapter last week, in chapter 11, most of chapter 11, we saw that we must work cautiously and prepare for risks that come in our Christian work. We are all called to minister the gospel of Christ wherever we go. And here's the thing, family. If you are idle, you are no threat to the devil. If you are not working for and towards the Lord in your calling in this season of life, you are no threat. You are not going to be targeted. But as soon as you are, you will be targeted. We do not change the message of our gospel, period. But sometimes our methods need to change. Essentially, we are to use the sharpest tools at our disposal. Speaking of tools, we have been given the spiritual gifts to use in service of the Lord. And lastly, the greatest work we can do is the work we do for Jesus. That's it. So let's pick it up. Uh, Chapter 11, verses 9 through 10. In your outlines this morning, if you have fill in the blank section or not, it is judgment will come. Judgment will come. Let's look at this together. Verses 9 through 10. It says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes for know that all these things God will bring you into judgment. You see Solomon in this last section of this book is going to and he has been specifically talking to young people. Right? He, he's talking to them uh, and Solomon is probably looking back from an old age to his days of youth before he started the under the sun premise. Right? And, and that, that under the sun premise took a hold on his life <clears throat> and on his mind. And he wanted his younger readers to have a better life. And Solomon, I believe, is trying to encourage the young person to follow after your dreams. Right To experience all that life's adventures and excitements that you can while you can. You see, as humans, we place all sorts of limitations and restrictions on life that God never placed there. Remember that God richly provides all things for us to enjoy. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with every, everything to enjoy. Remember, though, there is a, a limited period of time when we have the strength and the ability to do so. Right? God uh, approves as long as we obey his word. We don't want to get bent out of shape with this. And despite Solomon's terrible premise, I do believe that God wants us to enjoy our lives and live our lives to the fullest. The chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. When we go out to eat after service today, or you, know, you go home to make your sandwiches and you know, get ready for a nap, that's what I love doing on Sundays, right? We can do the, all of those things for the glory of God. Let this one bake your noodle for a second. God gave you taste buds. Why? Why? So that you can enjoy what he has provided for you. This is unbelievable. We get to smell things. Now, some things don't smell too good, right? But other things do. We get to enjoy every aspect of life. There was a Jewish teacher in the third century named Rab, and he said this, man will, be, man will give an account for all that he saw and did not enjoy. Now, I agree to that with it to an extent, but we don't want to use our freedoms and liberties and, and riches as a cover for evil. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16 warns us, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. We don't want to use our freedoms to sin against him. We want to use those freedoms and liberties and things that we can enjoy for the enhancement of our lives, for the worship of our great God and King. In the later half of verse 9, it says, Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that all these things God will bring you into judgment. And I believe Solomon is enthusiastically endorsing fun and enjoyment. But this is not a free pass for us to just experience whatever we want. This is not hedonism. He already tackled that early in the book. Right? He already said, it's all vanity. Vanity of vanities. But he does say the best thing that you could possibly do with this premise of forgetting God entirely, is to enjoy life while you have life. Enjoy the food, the drink, the wife that you have while you have it. Because you are going to die. Great, right? So encouraging. Thanks, Solomon. But again, this does not give us license to indulge in every desire before we must quote-unquote, grow up, right? Become an adult. And life bearing down upon them as required by age, right? As we do mature. The counsel in the last words of verse 9 provide clarification for that. But remember that eventually God will bring you into judgment. That is, what Solomon is talking about here is judgment of old age, which to Solomon is like divine retribution for the sins of early life. The sins early committed. Right? He would even go so far as to say it would be better off if we were never born. The person who has never existed is better off than the person who has lived a long life. Talk about depressing. And as believers, with the full counsel of God's Word, we should take note of this important point. The, well, that being, as a believer, you are not able to fully experience the joy of the Lord when you are prescribed to indulge your fleshly appetites. 
when you give in to disobeying and rebellion against God Almighty, you will not be able to experience the true joy of the Lord. It's kind of like having one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. But you have too much of the world to find satisfaction in Christ and too much of Christ to have satisfaction in the world. And we already know as we've gone through this book, the world has no satisfaction for anyone. It's all vanity. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. Choosing rather to mistreat with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting uh, pleasures of sin. You see, our joy will be handicapped when we give in to sin. We will never know true happiness or joy when living a life of sin. God has made our souls to suffer a sense of uneasiness, a sense of emptiness, never to be completely satisfied, which is the goal that Solomon is looking for at, throughout the entirety of this book. He is seeking out the main question of why am I here and what is my purpose? And he has not found it at all. Because his premise again is to ignore divine revelation from God, to ignore his word to ignore the testimony of his father. He doesn't want anything. He wants to seek out the truth apart from God. And the sad reality is you won't find it at all until you place your hope and trust in Jesus Christ. In verse 10, reading that one more time, it says, Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body for youth and the dawn of life our vanity. Okay. In verse 10, Solomon is explaining that while you are young, maximize your enjoyment and, maximize and minimize your sorrow, trouble, and vexation. Sin sown in youth will reap painful consequences. Right? And so in your outlines this morning, sin sown will reap painful consequences, but sowing God's word will reap great rewards. What we do with our time, what we choose to sow, sowing God's word in our hearts will reap precious dividends. It will be a bountiful harvest. And so what we must do then is to dedicate our lives to the reading and studying and obeying God's Word. We must read our Bibles, study our Bibles, obey what our Bibles state. And we will, there, because of that, we will sow and reap divine riches. You know, Solomon, as we now are moving into chapter 12, Solomon is stating that youth and the dawn of life are fleeting. So many of you, as you see my children running around and, you know, being little crazy people, you go, oh man, you need to, you need to enjoy it now because it's gone like that. I mean, we just had somebody come up on Wednesday and say that, but it, it's the truth. It just seemed like it was a couple of days ago that they were just so tiny, so helpless. And now they're like, oh, I don't need you, Dad. <laughs> Who are you? Get off of me, right? But it is, young age is, is fleeting. It is fleeting. And it's short lived. And nowhere in literature is there more a, a classic description of old age than in the first half of chapter 12. The meaning doesn't lie on the surface because it's presented as an allegory. But what we're going to see is an old man kind of shuffling towards the grave. Right? It just irresistibly going towards death. 
So let's pick that up. Verses 1 through 8 in your outlines this morning is the value of remembering God. The value of remembering God. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil day comes and the years draw near, of which you say, I have no pleasure in them, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keeper of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the door on the street are closed. When the sounds of the grinding is low and one rises up to the sound of bird, of a bird and the daughters of the song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terror terrors are in the way the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the street verse 6 before the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust return to the earth as was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Verse 8, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. What we see in verses 1 through 2 is a picture of, of age. And it's a, it's a warning to young people to remember their Creator in the days of their youth. Notice something disheartening here, though. Solomon doesn't say their Lord and Savior, their Redeemer. He simply says Creator. Creator. This is the only way Solomon could know God from his vantage point under the sun, realizing that there had to be a creator. For everything is fearfully and wonderfully made. There has to be a designer. Before <clears throat> the sunset time of life, when days are difficult and cruel, and the years are totally lacking in pleasure and enjoyment, Seek the Lord. You know, Solomon isn't wrong here by using Creator. It's just that his premise is skewed. He's not talking about, as we've already mentioned a plethora of times, God here is Elohim, which is a title for God. This is not, nowhere in this book is Yahweh mentioned at all. Y-H-W-H, Jehovah or Yahweh, however you want to say it, is not mentioned at all. Meaning there is no covenantal relationship with God. It's just information that he has about God. There's no true fellowship with him and God. <clears throat> but family, I'd hate to break it to you, but old age is a time when lights start to grow dim. Right? Both physically and emotionally, the days are dreary and the nights are long. Gloom and depression starts to settle in. Talk about depressing, right? You're like, oh, you're telling me, right? Everything hurts. But how are we supposed to apply something like that to our lives? How are we to apply this truth to our lives? The application is this, and this is in your outlines. Firstly, we should remember that God is continually present in our lives. God is continually present in our lives. Once we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit actually lives within our bodies. We need to remember this wonderful truth because it means that we, have always, we always have God's presence to guide us, to help us through the trials of life. So we should remember that God is continually present in our lives. Secondly, we should remember that God is our creator. He literally made us from nothing. 
By right of creation, God is entitled to have the absolute authority and control over our lives. God owns the patent on our lives as human beings, and he has never sold it off. He owns all the rights to the product he created. That is the reason we, as human beings, are accountable to God, and we must answer to him. And lastly, we need to know that God will definitely judge our lives, our words, our thoughts, and our deeds. The unbeliever will be doomed to eternal separation from God. We believe that we will be judged as children. Well, those who are children of God will be judged rather than lost sinners. We'll be, we will still have to give an answer to God for the things done in our bodies, whether good or bad. And we see part of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And as we continue in verses 3 through 5, Solomon now is going to use an example here of a house, a house falling apart. It was about three years ago was the first time I sneezed and threw out my back. And I knew, I was like, oh, that's, that's new. I've never, I've never experienced that before. You know, or, or you're, you're, you know, stretching or you're bending down. I remember my dad tore his ACL shopping. And if you know my, my father, he's an athlete. He, you know, he's 70 years old, runs three miles regularly and he's just very active but he tore his acl shopping he bent down to buy something on a bottom shelf and stood up and it went like just like that right and so solomon is going to use this this image of a decaying house that is falling apart and as it's the whole purpose is that the young person should learn to walk faithfully with God while they're still young. While they still have the, the energy and the strength of youth. Because a day will come when the mind or the soul, you might have the passion to do it, but you can't physically do it. You might want to serve the Lord energetically, but you can't as you once did. There are a lot of different commentators that have a sort of different understanding of an interpretation of specific metaphors in these chapters. I'm going to just give you my take on it. Whether or not you, know, you agree with me or disagree with me, it's besides the point because the application is still the same. So, as we read through verses 3 and 5, this is what we see. Remember our Creator while you are young, before your limbs tremble and you cannot protect your home. Right? Verse 3. In the day that the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent. Right? So strong, uh, the house trembles and the strong men. So that's speaking of, you know, uh, your arms the keepers of the house are the arms and the legs and the weakened and their tremble with age. Before your body is stooped over, before your teeth starting to start to fall out, before your eyesight starts to fail, before your legs become too weak to walk outside, before your hearing starts to fade, before your sleep is halted by birds, right? And before your Fear of heights and other dangers restrict your actions before your hair turns as white as an almond blossom. Before your, or you know, you don't have any hair at that point. Um, or before your uh, pace is slowed as a grasshopper at the end of the season. You see, family, what we're looking at here is specifically for the grasshopper. At the end of a grasshopper's life, it no longer hops around. It drags itself everywhere. 
And essentially what he's getting at here is the day will come when each one of us will look back on our younger days and say one of two things. I wish I would have done this or that. Or, on the flip side, thank God I did this and not that. No matter where you are in your life and in your walk with the Lord this morning, the fact that you are still here is an indicator that God is not done with you. God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you to still be here. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is how we should live our lives whether you're in your golden years or you're really young, live for Jesus because that's the only life worth living. Now when we get into verse 6, before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern, nobody Nobody agrees on what these things represent. So, again, I'm just going to give you my two cents on it. The silver cord probably refers to the breaking of the tender thread of life when the spirit is released from the body. Franny J. Uh, Crosby, who's a blind poet, she wrote this, Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king. So this is what I believe it is, is that sort of that point of death and then going to be with the Lord. The golden bowl is probably best understood as meaning the, the cranial cavity. And it's the breaking of that. It's really a poetic picture of the um, kind of the death of the, the mind as the time of death draws near. And the broken pitcher and the wheel taken together could mean the, uh, a reference to the circulatory system, something along those lines. What, what Solomon is getting at is we are all going to die. Right? Yeah, they, unless the Lord comes back. Maranatha, that would be great. But so far, 10 out of 10 people die. You know, that's, uh, if Google says it's true, then it must be so. But when we look at verse 7, and the dust returns, you know, so once the person, once the body, once that silver thread is gone, you know, rigor mortis now sets in, the body begins to turn to dust. While the spirit returns to God who gave it, or so it seemed to Solomon. You know, in the case of a believer, this conclusion is true. But the case of an unbeliever, the spirit goes to Hades, which is the waiting, the, the great white throne judgment of God, which then will therefore be given a spiritual body to endorse eternal p- torment. Not fun. But what we see in verse 8 is that Solomon comes full circle now, Right? He's coming to his conclusion on his research that everything is meaningless. The basic tenet that life under the sun, it's all vanity, meaningless, futile, empty. And his pathetic refrain is a reflection in a poem by Billy Barnes. And it, the poem is entitled, I stayed too long at the fair. (laughs) It's a pretty funny poem. It goes like this. I wanted the music to play forever. Have I stayed too long at the fair? 
I wanted the clown to be consistently clever. Have I stayed too long at the fair? I bought me a blue ribbon to tie up my hair, but I couldn't find anybody to care. The merry-go-round is beginning to slow now. Have I stayed too long at the fair? I wanted to live in a carnival city with laughter and love everywhere. I wanted my friends to be thrilled and thrilling and witty. I wanted someone to care, somebody to care. I found my blue ribbon all shiny and new, but now I discovered them no longer blue. The merry-go-round is beginning to taunt me. Have I stayed too long at the fair? There is, no, there is nothing to win and no one to want me. Have I stayed too long at the fair? Death, like everything else that Solomon has described in life, is empty and meaningless apart from God. Solomon has now covered the circuit of life and ended up where he began in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Everything, all of man's efforts and activities is pointless and vain. His achievements, vanity. His labor, vanity. His education, vanity. His knowledge, vanity. His pleasures, vanity. His pursuits, vanity. His priorities, vanity. Meaningless. His possessions, his morals, his amusements, his cultural advances, his position, his power, even his worship, vanity. His honor and creativity, his youth and his later years, and even his death is meaningless, vanity. Everything is empty and unsatisfying apart from God. Apart from God. God gives meaning to life, meaning to all of the activities and the achievements in life. God even gives meaning to death. This is the great and hard message that comes from the world's wisest man. And the most powerful and esteemed king, the wealthiest citizen, the teacher, Solomon. This is Solomon's, at the end of the day, he goes, everything is vanity. Everything is vanity. Essentially stating, nothing matters. But as believers, we know that is not true. Because starting in verse 9, so chapter 1, verse 1 Chapter 9, verses 4 through 14, I believe is the compiler. Chapter 1, verse 2, all the way through what we just read in chapter 12, verse 8, is Solomon's findings. And what we see is a compiler, one who compiled all of these documents together, brought them all together, gave us the introduction in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, and then gave us the conclusion in chapter 12, verses 9 through 14, because they pretty much state everything matters. Verses 9 through 14, everything matters. Let's read that together. Verse 9, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and the studying and the arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like the goads and the nails. Firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is as weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. 
everything matters. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic. That, I believe that it's a com- compilation of Solomon's findings and that there is another person writing in verses 9 through 14. If you disagree with me, that is okay. Again, it doesn't change the application whatsoever. Ecclesiastes is a very important book to study and to read because it teaches the reader to avoid the pitfalls of life that Solomon fell into and to find sense of of lasting fulfillment and satisfaction in life because it goes by fast. Another reason to study Ecclesiastes is uh, because it examined life and carefully compiled all of these findings that Solomon has. And as the compiler wanted the readers to be aware of Solomon's thorough research and his attempt to organize his findings in such a way that the truth could be communicated. That apart from God, there is no meaning. We should study this book because it is inspired by God. It's a part of our canon, and therefore it's going to be a huge benefit for us. The number of books that have been written trying to explain life and how to secure happiness are numerous. Go on Amazon, look up self-help books. You'll find hundreds of thousands of different books explaining how to have a better life. Let me tell you something. I could save you a whole lot of money right now. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible back there. You could take it. This is the only thing that would truly transform your life. There is nothing else that is like God's Word that can have the impact. I've seen people radically transformed in a way that only God can that it's only done through His Word. We might be able to change the habits of some people, but you're never able to change. You're never able to bring that spiritual aspect of a person to life. That's only what God can do through His Word. And family, the truth of the matter is that man will never come up with something that could take the place of of our Bibles. No, I can't replace Scripture. You should not be getting your, your one meal a week, right, from me. You should be feeding on the Word of God every single day, studying God's Word, because commentaries can fail you. I can fail you. I will, okay? Like, I'm, I'm not perfect. I will inevitably say something that is wrong and contrary, have mercy, right? But the thing that will never fail you is God's Word. Is God's Word. It's perfect and can be completely trusted. His Word is the only source of complete truth and the only source of wellspring of salvation. God's Word is a manual for living. It it communicates the will and the plan of God for us. It was miraculously and supernaturally given by God. And this is His complete, exclusive revelation to the human race. It's this book right here. And what people uh, write, even believers, can be fallible. That is why we must test everything we read through Scripture. Through Scripture itself. Because a truly wise person will faithfully study God's Word. And in doing so, you will be blessed. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, as a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightfully handling the Word of truth. God's Word. That's where it's at. And our last two verses sum up the conclusion for Solomon and his findings. 
the end of the matter, all that has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The ultimate conclusion to this experiment, this case study, this research, is to fear God and keep his commandments. And notice that the fear of God precedes obedience to God. Those who keep God's commandments do so because they revere God for who he is. Because they maintain a healthy sense of um, apprehension about their responsibility and their accountability to God. They revere him. This word duty in many translations is not, yeah, the whole duty of man. That, that word isn't actually in the Hebrew here. And so what this means is it, it literally states, this is the whole of man, is to fear God and to keep his commandments. The fear of God and obedience to him are what make people complete. If you are lacking in something, you must ask yourself some important questions. And we'll get to those in just a second. But family, we have a God-shaped hole in our hearts. As cliche as that sounds, we do. Because the only thing that will bring true satisfaction to your life, to my life, is Jesus Christ. G.K. Well, G. Campbell Morgan had this to say. He said, Man in his eternity must, must, being, well, yeah, must be with God, the whole of man, the fear of God. And he also stated, Here is shown the way of folly. The way of folly is that of forgetting God and trying to satisfy a human soul with anything which well, with the things which are dust. You want to have dissatisfaction in your life? Try to look for money as your source of satisfaction. Try to look at your work, your job as your satisfaction. You won't find it. If you want, to tr- if you want true satisfaction, it is as clear as day, and as, as clear as I can make it, it is only Jesus Christ. That is the solution. And family, every good sermon takes God's word and points out the decisions we need to make to become stronger followers of God. That is what I aim to do every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Tuesday morning devotion study, men's study, is that we are all pointing each other towards Christ. We have to examine ourselves and ask ourselves some very clear questions. And these are actually in your outline The first being, is the Lord at the center of your life? Is the Lord at the center of your life? Is my life full and satisfying because of the presence of God or is it empty and meaningless because His absence? The second, am I living in the fear of God? Have I made peace with Him through accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior? Does my life reflect His priority in my life? Does it reflect His Lordship in my life? Am I living as though I realize I must stand before Him in judgment? Because you will. You will. Am I living in the fear of God? And thirdly, am I living in obedience to God's commandments are there areas in my life thoughts words deeds that are displeasing and disobedient to what god has called me to do asking ourselves those questions will make sure that we have our priorities straight john chapter 14 verse 15 Jesus stated, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he 
it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So where are we going to, what are we going to do, family? What are we going to do with the life that God has given us? Because we've already seen throughout all of this book, a life apart from Christ, meaningless. You can only find your satisfaction in Him. So what we must do is live it out. Live it out. Love God and love his people and love the people in our community, in our sphere of influence, loving people. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up and we're going to close with the song. Again, I want to encourage you guys with John 14, 15. If you love me, this is Jesus speaking, you will keep my commandments. Father, we praise you. We glorify your name. Lord, we are so honored and blessed to be here in this place. We want to worship you as the true and living God, giving you all the glory, Lord. We praise you. Amen. Family, let's all stand. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's praise God.